Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Produce Buzzers Podcast. We are so happy you have joined us today, and I think you will be too after the show is over, because you will learn a lot about fresh fruits and vegetables, how to select and store them, how to prepare and cook them, and surprising facts about their history and origin. We hope it inspires you to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, not only for your health, but also for your delight and pleasure as you explore their amazing world of taste and delicious flavors. Eating more of them will transform your life in so many positive ways. So settle back, relax, and get ready for another delicious adventure with the Produce Buzzers. and welcome to another delicious episode of the Produce Buzzers podcast. I'm your host, Edwin Stepp, an executive editor of ProduceBuzz.com. I'm joined once again by Teresa Nolan, a founder and president of Produce Buzz, along with Rick Stepp and Cynthia Benedetto, both contributing editors to Produce Buzz. Now, Produce Buzzers podcast fans, we have a very special guest on the show this week. He is a longtime friend and colleague, who used to work with the four of us produce buzzers many years ago. If he weren't so busy as a high-level executive in the produce industry now, we would have recruited him to be on this show on a regular basis because he was once like part of our family. This week's guest is Mark Munger, Senior Director of Marketing for Ocean Mist Farms based in Castroville, California in the Monterey, California area. Mark worked for Teresa's Nolan Network alongside Rick, Cynthia, and me in the early 1990s. He was a valuable part of our team of merchandisers representing our clients of companies and commodities on the West Coast. Since that time, he has been a rising star in the produce business. After getting the call from the Produce Marketing Association, he abandoned us to work for them as the director of their retail division. From there, he went to work for Driscoll Strawberries as marketing director. His next stop was with Andrew Williamson Fresh Produce, where he spent about 10 years as vice president of marketing. After that, he was hired as vice president of sales and marketing at Four Earth Farms in Los Angeles, California, a leading purveyor of full range of vegetables. He spent almost 10 years in that position until just last year, he accepted his current position at Ocean Mist Farms. Ocean Mist is a grower, packer, and shipper of all types of vegetables, from a wide variety of lettuces, cabbages, and brassicas to cilantro, beets, and radishes. Mark is responsible for all aspects of the company's strategic marketing and brand building activities. Mark has also served on several industry boards, including the United Fresh Board of Directors and the Center for Growing Talent Board. Mark attended University of California, Davis, and has a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture Science and Management. So with over 36 years of experience in the produce business, it's needless to say we have a true veteran of the produce world with us today who can enlighten us on just about any item that you see in your produce department. But today we're going to focus on Ocean Mist Star product, at least the way I see it, artichokes. We will talk about some of their other delicious veggies, but since it is the prime artichoke season, we want to learn as much as we can about them as possible for Mark to help you enjoy these delicious and seductive treats. Mark, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Edwin. I'm excited to be here. And and only one correction in your intro, which was very, very kind. I still consider myself to be a member of your family. Ah, that's you good. Can't, you, can't, uh, <laughs> you can't take it away. We work too closely together for too many years. Yeah, that, that's, that's beautiful. I love that. Thank you. You are. We consider you that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to get to the artichokes and other veggies, but first we want to know more about your background. For instance, uh, first of all, how much do you miss working with all of us? Uh, I think about it every day. You know, I I think uh, the successful career starts with a strong foundation. And back when I got into the produce industry, um, Nolan Network was really the the job that I did in the beginning and and getting out and merchandising, learning about how the retail and food service world works. getting to know people and and understand the industry from really the grassroots foundation up, I think really played a a really strong 
role in in allowing me to grow in the industry and and be able to have the opportunity to take on the the job opportunities that I've had. Well, that's great. That that's very uh, we're honored to hear you say that. Uh, was the Nolan Network your first job in the business, or did you have something before that? Well, my first job in the industry was with a commodity board called the California Kiwi Fruit Commission, right. right out of college, and um, and that's actually how I met Teresa. Um, we, when I was there, we were looking for merchandising services for the Kiwi Fruit Commission, but we were only a six-month commodity, and so we couldn't have a full-time year-round staff. And Teresa came in and presented the idea for the Nolan Network, which was contract and work for lots of different commodity boards and um, utilize the services when they needed merchandising and, and work with other commodity boards during their seasons. And um, so that was how we got introduced. But uh, Kiwis was my very first uh, first uh, foray. I, I was an animal science major. And oh, really? Was going to... Uh, going to animal production, but it was a tough time. It was right when red meat was being villainized and we were in a recession. And um, so had an opportune uh, opportunity come up to uh, to take the job with Kiwi and fell in love with the industry and the growers and the health benefits of fresh produce and never looked back. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I knew that. I knew that you were there first and we came in you and, and one since you hired Teresa uh, and then she hired you, I guess <laughs> I, I had the order wrong there. It sounds like, <laughs> so did you, what, what made you interested in agriculture in general? Were you connected to farming as a, as a young, a young, your family? I wasn't young. connected to farming. I, I had a legacy, which was that my grandfather was actually a produce wholesaler in Fresno. Oh, wow. He owned a company called Hobbs Parsons and was a full line produce distributor. Um, he died when I was young. So I had produce in the blood, but I didn't get any hands-on experience. I remember going and um, playing in the banana boxes and, <laughs> and and the rail cars and and whatnot back in the early days. But I was always interested in food agriculture. I uh, I spent some time uh, living on a um, 500 head cow calf operation um, during some formative years and rode horses and and was kind of into the ag scene. And Davis just seemed like a natural place to go and pursued the animal science, but you're really surrounded by agriculture on the UC yeah. Davis campus, whether it's tree fruits or viticulture or or whatnot. And and I caught the bug and and you know kind of fun. Most of uh, my buddies that I was in college with and, and actually in fraternity are, are in the fresh produce industry as well. And so uh, get great. to work around and see a lot of them. And yeah. That's, uh, yeah. UC Davis is one of the top ag schools in the world. If not the top, it's gotta be, it, 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 I, I imagine they could claim to be the top. <laughs> I, you know, I think Cornell, Cal Poly, a lot of them make that claim. It was a yeah. great education for me and, and really uh, got me, pointed towards food, food agriculture. And, and like I said, well, I'm, I'm so excited that I kind of stumbled into the fresh produce industry because I can't think of a better industry and a better career. Yeah. But you were a cowboy then. I, I didn't know that. I was a cowboy. I still uh, <laughs> so, somewhere in some boxes is, is a lariat. And, and you know, there, there were a couple of years where I, I the only thing I wore was a cowboy boot. So, uh, Times have changed, but uh, a cowboy hat too. Oh or, yeah. So you had a Larry, you could rope cows. I could rope, rope cows. I'm not oh, sure man. I could now, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's all in the wrist. Ah, that, hey, you got to do a demonstration for us. <laughs> but it's been a long time since I had my hand on a lariat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fascinating. I had, did not know that about you, but it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> so. Well, tell us about what you're doing at Ocean Mist. Well, first of all, tell us about Ocean Mist. It's it's quite an old company. It's been around for a while, right? It is, yeah. Ocean Mist was actually um, founded by uh, four Italian families in 1924, um, which we're excited because if you look at the calendar, that means that next year we are going to hit a 100-year anniversary. Oh, fantastic. The company is now a fourth-generation family. 
Um, the families of the original founders are still involved. And, um, and we're really excited about that. We are a farming family um, company. Um, we are vertically integrated. So um, we are very um, involved in uh, seed and varietal development, um, field planting, um, growing, harvesting, um, and we uh, and production. Uh, we do value-added produce now as well. Um, By that, you mean for our listeners, uh, pre-cut kind of things or what? Yep, what that's, that that's fairly new for the company. We've been doing it for five years, but we now do broccoli florets, cauliflower oh. florets, medley mixes, um, halved Brussels sprouts, uh, cauliflower rice, some really more convenience oriented, uh, partially processed, ready to prepare items. Yeah, great, but, uh, great. And that's that's become a big item in the produce department because people's lives are so busy. So uh, it really has. So this this company was founded here in a little town called Castroville, California. We are uh, right up next to the Monterey Bay. It's an absolutely beautiful setting. Uh, most of our farms are within a stone's throw of the ocean. Um, I was walking in fields yesterday and you raise your eye up and you're looking at the sand dunes and, and literally across the sand dunes is the ocean. Hence the name ocean mist. A lot of people wonder what that means. Um, but, you know, when those waves crash, uh, they do put up a mist. And when you're standing in some of our fields and the wind is blowing, you can actually feel the mist from the ocean. And it's really a spectacular and perfect location in the summertime to grow fresh vegetables. Because um, it's so much cooler. It, it, it dissipates that California heat, right? It, it is. And that's, I think that's really what makes this whole Salinas Valley, Castroville area, what they call a salad bowl of the world. The Monterey Bay is very deep and you have a very cold California current that's coming down the coast and it hits this big trough of the Monterey Bay and, and the cold water goes down and there's a huge underwelling that comes up and it brings a lot of cold water to the surface. It meets the warm California air and it makes a lot of fog in the summertime and that blows into the Salinas Valley and, and it's really why we can grow all these really beautiful, um, high, top, high quality, great tasting and fresh vegetables. You go um, 10 or 12 miles inland and it might be 90 or 100 degrees when you're on most of our farms. And, you know, I, I wear a jacket uh, pretty much every single day. It, it can be 50 degrees. So you might actually have a 50 degree variance just within 10 miles of where most of our farms are. Yeah, I've, I've, I've witnessed that, experienced that in California in several places. Yeah, that's a beautiful place there, beautiful area, uh, great place to grow vegetables. So tell us, where do you, where else do you grow? Do you grow only in that area, Salinas Valley, or do it, you grow in other parts? It's a great question. We are primarily a California um, grow company, but, um, you know, initially it was very seasonal. We grew up here from the early spring until the late fall, and then um, the fields would go dormant. About 50 years ago, the company started to grow in the um, Yuma Desert of Arizona. Right. And as that area became more popular, um, the company was looking around for some newer areas and really invested heavily in um, an area called the Coachella Valley, mm -hmm. which if you're familiar with Palm Springs area, it's south of Palm Springs. And um, it also is a desert region. So it is our primary winter growing region. And it's unique because um you know, if, if you've listened to the news and the stories about the um, Colorado River, uh, much of Yuma gets its water from the Colorado River to irrigate their crops. And that we're, we've been overusing that water, not just agriculture. A lot of people um, have, are tapped into the Colorado River. If you go to Coachella, it's surrounded by 10,000 foot mountains all the way around. And even though it's a desert, um, all of that water from the snow in those mountains comes down the hills and percolates into the sand. And there's a giant aquifer under the Coachella Valley. And um, while we still get a little bit of water from the Colorado River, um, it's really a great area to grow in the winter time because we have really ample access to really clean, pure water for irrigation. And so the company 
was one of the few ag companies that figured that out. And we went down and bought a lot of land and built a really beautiful um, cooling and distribution facility down there and are really well established. So about 90% of what we grow is primarily in California. Um, Castroville in the summer, Coachella in the winter. We supplement a little bit with Yuma, Arizona. And then a couple of um, items we grow down in Mexico uh, just for um, transitional purposes. But those are our main main areas. Yeah, that gives you the year-round supply, which is very important to compete in the, that business uh, to have your brand out there year-round. So it makes sense. So that, of course, a lot of people are going to the Southern Hemisphere, not maybe not so much for vegetables, but for fruit. Certainly they year-round by going to the southern hemisphere but you you don't you have not got anything in the southern hemisphere it sounds like we don't no we um just for since we primarily are a, a fresh vegetable company it's nice to be primarily here in california primarily on the west coast and yeah. uh, it, it simplifies things but you are right um, it's really critical the whole year-round supply um uh, and um uh, you consumers want to go to the store and buy a head of lettuce or buy an artichoke when they need it and not have to really think about seasonality. And, and I, I think agriculture has been innovative in finding ways to grow in the right areas um, with the right technology so that we can have fruits and vegetables in the store all year round. I think we, uh, we've done a, a really great job doing that in the United States. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's been a miracle, really the food supply chain, being able to get anything you want almost all year round. So let, let me, uh, speaking of the weather and the rains, uh, I wanted to ask you about how the heavy rains this winter has affected what you're doing there at Ocean Mist. Have, have you guys been okay or has it been a struggle? We were good. You know, fortunately, highest priority is our people. And I'm happy to say that everybody was kept safe um, through the floods. And and so that's the most important thing. The next, um, it was a wet year. It, it was disruptive. Um, you know, we, uh, we had several thousand acres that were put out of production because of the rain. And um, some of them were flooded. Most of it was just too wet to get into plant. And so um, we, you know, we're always thinking ahead and um, you've got to plant at certain windows so that we can harvest down the road in certain times. And, and we had a difficult time getting into a lot of our fields. So this spring, and we're mostly past it now, but uh, April, uh, there was a lot of supply disruptions because of the rain. Uh, so things that normally would have been harvested in, in early April didn't come until May. Um, and, and so it was a challenging time, um, but um, we're really kind of through that disruptive period and, and the summer is looking really, really good. I will say on a macro, the rain was very welcome. Um, yeah. You probably know that the West Coast, especially California, is in what they call a mega drought. And if you really look at the long-term pattern, we're still in that drought, but it was we were running out of water and yeah. um, and there was a big concern. And so I always view a wet year like that, sort of like investing money in your 401k. Um, wow. You know, we need the rain, we need the water, we need the aquifers full, we need the reservoirs full. And we really got a, a welcome relief. And so to have some of these temporary disruptions, and I know some people in some communities got flooded really badly and, and we feel terrible about that. But from a food stability, production stability standpoint, the, the water on a bigger picture was very welcome. So that's good news. Good to hear. Uh, sounds like except for uh, maybe a few weeks delay, we will have plenty of artichokes this year to enjoy. So I think it's time we talk about artichokes. Well, so let's. Let's talk a little bit about artichoke. So yes, Ocean do. Mist actually grows 30 different fresh vegetable items, um, yeah. but we are best known for artichokes. Um, when the company was founded in 1924, they actually grew two items. They were uh, Italian immigrants and they came with what they knew, um, which was how to grow artichokes and how to grow Brussels sprouts. And those were the two items that the company 
was founded on. And then over the years, we rolled out the leaf lettuces and broccoli and cauliflower and, and whatnot. But we are best known for artichoke. So the artichoke world is kind of complex. The original artichoke, the one that our company started growing, and we were the first ones to commercialize artichokes in North America, was a um, perennial variety, um, which meant that it produces artichokes for many, many years. And we call it now the heirloom variety. And when we wanted to propagate more artichokes after the season, you would go to one of these perennial artichoke plants and they would split it and sometimes quarter it into four pieces and then pull those four pieces with their roots out and plant those four pieces. And then that one artichoke plant became four. And so in essence, if you think about it, most of those plants are, are all clones of each other. From one mother plant, you've made thousands. And the, the perennial really was the primary artichoke that was produced in California for the first 80 years. And um, it was very seasonal. It would come in around the 1st of, of April and would produce uh, until kind of the middle of summer. When you hit about July, its production was was done. It's a very thorny variety, Cynthia, which is, I think, why, you know, people associated a certain kind of artichoke with thorns. It's a little bit of a misnomer because um, new varieties of artichokes, we have thorn and thornless. And so you can't really tell unless you know who you're talking to. Um, so that was our predominant variety. Um, the challenge with it is that it... This heirloom variety is seasonal. It's very temperamental. And so it was difficult to project or estimate when we were going to get the production, how long the production was going to last. Very expensive to grow because if you think about a perennial, um, if it's only producing for three or four months, it's staying in that field 12 months. And so it ties your field up for the whole year for just a, a couple of month production window. And so this company and, and, um, and a couple of research and development companies began to try and innovate the artichoke, created what we call an annual variety. We call it a seeded variety. And so it's a variety that you actually let in your breeding fields. You let the artichoke blossom out and you collect those seeds and then plant the seeds and grow them into tiny little starts. And then you plant them in the fields you have a lot more predictability. They produce very much like a, a traditional produce crop does. You plant them and depending on the time of the year, you'll get your crop you know, several months later. And once you harvest that crop, it's disked back in and you start over again. And so it becomes an annual. The annual has better production. Um, it has much more predictability. And most of the artichokes that we get in the stores now are annuals and, and it's kind of taking over from the, the heirloom is, is winding down. We've been breeding these annual or these seeded varieties now for about 30 years. And it's the reason that we're able to farm in the Coachella desert. The heirloom variety needs to be grown very close to the ocean and very cold growing conditions. Hmm. And as we were developing new varieties, we were finding some that were a little bit more heat tolerant that could be grown during shorter days, like in the wintertime. And that really is what allowed us as a company to extend the season to year round. We still grow the heirloom variety, but it's a pretty small percentage of our total production now. And I'm really excited to say I'm, I'm fairly new with the company, but I've been spending a lot of time with our research and development teams. Um, we just have some phenomenal varieties. And Everybody will tell you the very best tasting artichoke is that heirloom variety. Um, really? It's it's that big, rich, buttery flavored artichoke with a big heart in it. And, um, and so that's been the target that we've been aiming for in our annual varieties. And, you know, early on, I think our annual varieties probably didn't taste very good or, or certainly not as good as, as that heirloom variety. And I think if you look at consumption trends, we saw artichoke consumption nationally 
kind of falter and stall in the early days of rolling out our our seeded varieties. Um, but I can actually tell you because we have a tasting panel and I <laughs> was very um, excited to get to join it because it means that I get to eat artichokes all the time. When you go buy an artichoke now and you go cook it, um, you're getting that big heart. You're getting that buttery flavor. Um, the heirlooms have been our target. You know, it's taken a long time, but we're really excited. Our, our varieties now year round whether they're growing in the desert, whether they're growing up here in Castroville, really taste good. And and I think unless you're one of the growers and you're really close to it, they can tell the difference between varieties um, that I think most consumers are going to be really happy with what they find. We're breeding them the old fashioned way. There's no GMO in the breeding. It's yeah. They're all hand pollinated. They're all hand selected. It's a very slow process to to breed artichokes. Um, but we're really beginning to understand the genetics behind the artichokes and the parameters that we can really select for. And um, and I'm, I'm happy, you know, a lot of times breeders are, are listening to the growers only. And, you know, a grower is always going to tell a breeder that they want a variety that has great yields. It's all about yeah. yield. And, um, you know, this company has always been very consumer centric and consumer driven. And, you know, when you talk to consumers, what they want is flavor. And so while yield is still absolutely critical, we have to make sure the farms stay profitable. They talk about yield and flavor equally in, in the same sentences. And, and that's the biggest part of the battle because these breeders can get you anything you want, ultimately, to have them really be focused on flavor and to have the company have these flavor panels set up so that we're really tasting them and diving into these varieties and and marketing is getting to play a role in in the varietal development and and I always view marketing to the company we are the voice of the consumer to the company we're the ones that are listening to what the consumers say and need and bringing that information back and and so I'm I'm really excited about what the company is doing I think artichokes taste fantastic now and just wait because the varieties that are coming down the pike that we're starting to get more into commercial are even better and one of the things that came out in all this R&D was the purple artichoke yes. and um, and that one is still seasonal you can get purples from ocean mist from about the first of December through um, I'll say the first of June Although this year, because all this cold weather, there's going to be some nice purples in the market for at least another month. Um, and the purples actually have an absolutely amazing flavor. Uh, they, for whatever reason, because of the color or the way they grow or their genetics, have kind of helped speed things up. And, and if I blindfolded you, you would have a difficult time dis discriminating between an heirloom and a purple. So not only do you get that beautiful color, because they really are this deep, deep purple color that stays through the cooking, um, they have great flavor as well. And, you know, our, our goal over the next couple of years is to get purples year round as well. But right, um, right so now- the purple is a hybrid. It wasn't a naturally occurring- Well, the- Purple has been in artichokes for thousands of years. It's really interesting. If you go walk markets in Europe, you will find lots of purple color in the artichokes. Initially, I think our four founders thought green was the color they should be, and that was what they focused on. But um, that purple gene in the artichokes is pretty strong. So when you walk any farmer's market in Italy and or in Spain or, you know, one of those Mediterranean markets, which is really where artichokes came from, um, you'll see a lot of purple um, colors there. Regarding the, the globe is the one that has the thorns on the end? The globe is, um, it's theoretically a variety, but it is probably more big picture um, what we refer to as most green artichokes. Um, now we call them globe. If, if you look at the artichoke world, there are literally hundreds of varieties. And our company um, has spent a lot of time 
doing um, um, varietal development. So just our company alone, we have um, dozens of proprietary varieties and, and I'm excited to say more to come as we continue to try and strive for you know, better tasting, easier to cook artichokes. But um, but globe is kind of the general term that people will refer to when they're talking about a green artichoke. So the globe, I've read that the globe variety is the biggest commercially grown, but you're saying that globe variety could be, there could be other actual varieties within that classification. Yes. Interesting. That's yes. interesting. Yeah. Cynthia, you had something to say? Come on. <laughs> I don't know why she's getting so shy. I'm not I, shy. I can't get a word in edgewise, session, but thank you. Um, so we're after... making history here that Cynthia can't get a word in edgewise, and I'm happy Seriously? to be part of the history. <laughs> Stranger good. things have never happened. Is an artichoke a, a hardware type item? Hardware? What do you mean, Cynthia? In terms of, you know, it's not spinach that has like, you know, it's like the potato, onion, and just hearty, and you don't have to. A long shelf about life. The shelf life. You know, it's a flower. So just like flowers, it is still a fairly sensitive crop. Um, it definitely, if held in refrigeration and treated properly, um, it, it does have a good shelf life, um, but it's not a hard good. If, if you leave it on the counter for a day, you'll see the leaves dry up really fast. Keeping artichokes in a plastic bag in your refrigerator, um, cool until you're ready to use them, is the biggest suggestion for flavor, for maintaining the product quality. So they, they will dry up really quick outside of the refrigerator. Um, it's interesting, too, if you cut an artichoke in half to grill it or whatnot, um, it also oxidizes very quickly. So that green turns brown really, really fast. You can actually watch it happening when you cut an artichoke open. Um, it's one of the things that our researchers are trying to modify to, to sort of slow down that oxidation. But consumers can just actually put some lemon juice on an artichoke if you cut them in half, that citric acid will slow down that oxidation process and keep that real beautiful green vibrant color uh, when you cut them open. I've never I've noticed that before. steamed them. So when you get to taste them at work, how are they cooking them? Well, that's a great question. Um, because we're evaluating them from a flavor perspective, we have to be consistent. And so we do steam them here. Um, and I think that's the probably the most popular way people serve artichokes. Um, I'll say this once and hopefully I'll get a chance to say it again at the end. Ocean Mist has been developing artichoke recipes for a hundred years. And we, I think, have probably the best collection of recipes and serving and usage ideas. So consumers can actually go to oceanmist.com or they can go to allaboutartichokes.com and find literally hundreds and hundreds of artichoke recipes. Um, it, while it doesn't seem really versatile, when you really start looking at artichokes, it is probably one of the most versatile vegetables that we have. You can literally bake it, broil it, boil it, fry it, saute it, um, Grill it. You already grill mentioned it. That. Um, you know, and and so it really is a microwave, Rick. You, you can microwave if you don't want to wait for them to boil. We, we have a we have a running joke here because Rick always has a microwave vegetable recipe on the show. Add a little bit of water. We kidding. We tease them. About it. So. Well, you know, I it's been a long time. We uh, represented the California Artichoke Board for several years. I don't re remember Mark if you worked with them. Was oh, it? yeah. No, I was with you when we had artichokes in our portfolio. So, um, But I, I don't remember. I have a microwave steamer that I use for vegetables, and I don't think I've ever put an artichoke in that. I'm going to try it now. Yeah, so you want to put it be a, better to do the baby artichokes or the big ones? 
Well, you know, the babies cook so quick um, that um, they're much more versatile for other things. You know, your standard artichoke does take, you know, about 30 to, to 35 minutes to boil. Um, and so, but you can actually cook it in a microwave in about five minutes. We do have microwave recipes um, and kind of how-to videos um, on the website as well. So it, it's a really good thing. Kind of one of our newest trends, and, and we've just developed a whole bunch of fun recipes for it, is um, air fryers, which is kind of a fun way to do it in the summertime if you don't want to have a big pot boiling for 35 minutes in your kitchen when it's hot. Um, the air fryer, they cook really quick in there, and we've got some really delicious recipes as well. That's How do the Instapots work for artichokes they're a pressure cooker type thing they, they do okay um you have to watch your timing and make sure that you don't overcook them in a in a pressure cooker because if you overcook an artichoke it gets kind of soggy um and then you're, you're eating more water than you really are all that delicious meat and heart but um you know that is another way to do it we have some fun stewing recipes um, where they're an ingredient um, cooked in a um, pressure cooker or or cooking pot with you know with other sort of stew items and and they make a really great complement to uh, you know carrots and potatoes and and um, celery. That's interesting. Is, is that just uh, the heart that you use in a stew, or would you use a baby artichoke? I can't imagine you. Or are you are you cutting up? Tell us you, what. How, you're taking off most of the leaves if you're using a, you know, uh, the most of the tops of the leaves if you're using a, a large artichoke. The baby artichokes are great because you cut the tips of the leaf off and you can throw it in there and, and the whole thing is edible. And, yeah. um, you know, well, so yeah. Go ahead. It's, it's fun. And, um, you know, we are talking babies. It's not a different variety or a different plant. Um, the way an artichoke produces, and, and on our website, you can actually see some videos that show you what an artichoke plant looks like. If you haven't seen one, they're, they're very prehistoric looking, <laughs> but an artichoke, each plant produces about between 15 and 20 artichokes, and the first artichoke comes right up through the center of the plant. We call it the primary artichoke, and it has a real thick stem on it, and it's the biggest artichoke that the plant produces. And then right behind it is a secondary set of artichokes that come up kind of in, in, um, in a circle around the primary. And they tend to be a little bit smaller and um, a little bit smaller stem on them. And then we have tertiaries that come up around the secondaries. And so the plant just keeps producing artichokes kind of spiraling outward towards the outside of the plant, but each next set is slightly smaller than the first set. And the tertiary or the fourth set that come out generally are the baby artichokes. Um, and if you really think about the stem like an umbilical cord, you know, the bigger the stem, the more nutrients that that plant can put into the product. And as the, you know, it's producing more and more at the same time, in the beginning, it's got all its energy just going into that primary. Um, you know, by the time it's got, you know, a bunch of artichokes, the stems are smaller and so they're not getting as much energy put into it. And so the, the artichokes don't get as big and the crews will come along and, and pick those. So they're usually the last artichokes that are picked off of the plant. But uh, one of the things that we used to tell in our little spiel that we gave to retailers is that artichokes, uh, in high society, if a young man came as a suitor, uh, the mother of the daughter would serve artichokes to see how cultured he was, because <laughs> if he didn't know how to eat an artichoke, it meant he was not very cultured. <laughs> uh, so maybe you'd like to tell us about how to eat an artichoke. I actually told that story before I served it to a guest that a, a couple that came over uh, for dinner one time and they were sitting there looking at each other. They didn't know how to eat it either. So uh, then yeah, <laughs> I don't really want to eat that. I'll take a pass on it next time. It's interesting, Teresa. I think we're going to go down the road of 
aphrodisiac. Um, <laughs> a little bit of a rumor that, you know, Nuco actually back several hundred years and, and artichokes had a, a great reputation for being an aphrodisiac. As a marketer, I'd love to promote that, but um, <laughs> I don't think there's any scientific proof, but um, right. they are really healthy for you. And so there might be a connection there. But, yeah. um, you know, artichokes are fun. Um, they're an event. And, um, you know, there's so much fun for families because, you know, how often do you get to play with your food? And, and the <laughs> best way to eat an artichoke is with your hands. If you were talking about a large artichoke, the outside leaves, the biggest leaves tend to be a little bit tough. They're protecting the, the artichoke. Once the artichoke is cooked, and, and if you're steaming it or boiling it, the best way to tell that it's cooked is that those outside leaves just come right off of the plant. Um, when it's not quite cooked, they, they hang on a little bit and, and don't tear off easy. But when they just come right off, that usually is an indicator that the artichoke is ready to eat. And, you know, what we suggest is find your, your favorite dipping sauce. Um, although there are a lot of affectionados here with this company that just eat them artichoke only because of that flavor. But a lot of yeah. people like to use mayonnaise or, um, or uh, melted butter or a combination of those, some kind of fun aioli sauce. People will make a, kind of a garlic um, aioli sauce for them, all kinds of different options. But, you know, you peel those leaves off and you dip into your favorite sauce and put them in your mouth and just kind of scrape off. You know, most of what you're eating on the leaves is part of the heart. It grows up into the leaves and it's that meaty part. Once you get down to more uh, white colored, very clear leaves, those are um, generally not as, as edible as the big green leaves on the outside of the artichoke. So at that point, you want to take those off and scrape them. And underneath those, you're going to see sort of a white furry. That's actually the choke part of the artichoke. Um, if you let the artichoke grow into a flower, that actually is what becomes part of the flower of the artichoke. And I like to just take a spoon and kind of scrape that off. And underneath, you'll find a um, firm kind of meaty portion. And we call that the heart of the artichoke. And, and that's, the, that's the toy in the um, Cracker Jack box. The heart yeah. is far the, the best part. And that's the payoff. It, it really is. And, and again, you know, if, if somebody's listening to this and they haven't tried an artichoke or they're unsure, I really encourage them to go to the allaboutartichokes.com because we've got graphics of the inside of an artichoke, what you can eat, what you can't eat. Um, but, uh, you know, it really is all about heart. And, um, you know, so we, we have a lot of fun slogans, you know, like eat your heart out artichoke and, and, you know, we're the, we're the vegetable with heart because it, it is about the heart. Uh, yeah. I story. like those, I like those clear leaves. They're not as flavorful, but I always eat them. You know. Yeah. I, uh, a lot I mean, you know, most of the artichoke is edible. Um, yeah. We had a consumer write us one time and say she couldn't eat artichokes because she was vegetarian and she, <laughs> she couldn't eat the heart. And, oh, um, no. <laughs> but, um, I don't know if maybe we are doing a good job educating, but, uh, but that is the best part of the other joke. Oh, that's now, great. what was that again? Could you repeat it? Kidding. Um, <laughs> thank goodness that we are not doing merchandising for uh, your company because Artie the Choke, the art, Artie the Artichoke. I yep. get stuck in that thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm fortunate that uh, um, I'm too tall for Artie. So I, I don't get to wear him either, but we love Artie. He's a great spokesperson for the company. <laughs> yeah. Interesting with the, you know, with the growth of our purple varieties, we created a second character and her name is um, Viola. Um, uh, and she's uh, Artie's purple girlfriend man uh, is she smaller if, if, if you follow our um social media you'll see that uh, during the purple season she comes to visit Artie, and and they take all kinds of great adventures around california so oh wow. no but is she smaller like a 
No, no, she's big. Perp, you know. Um, the hey, 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 hey! You can't say she and big in the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Fat shaming here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She is absolutely beautiful. Let me tell you. So, <laughs> that's cool. no you know, Mark. Beautiful. You mentioned uh, the mayonnaise. Uh, we used to mix a little bit of Italian vinaigrette, uh, Italian dressing with the mayonnaise and that gave it a little bit more flavor and that was a really good depth yeah, for artichoke. Yeah. I put so. breadcrumbs and cheese and garlic and pepper and you stuff it in there and well the, what, what one of the most popular uh, appetizers at restaurants is spinach artichoke dip so I imagine that uh, when people are ordering that in a restaurant, they're getting some spinach and artichokes from Ocean Mist. You you did, said you did do a lot with food service. Uh, what about canned artichoke hearts, that kind of thing? Are you guys into that? Um, not yet, but uh, you just never know what might yeah. be coming down the pike. I, I think they're not quite as good as just after a steamed <laughs> fresh one. But you know, there's nothing like fresh cooked produce. But um, you know, it's interesting. Um, we do a lot of focus groups and we found that most consumers um, pathway into fresh artichokes is through marinated artichokes. Oh, right. um, marinated. Those so, are artichokes. you know, Those they, are. they will have marinated artichokes or they'll have artichokes, um, marinated artichokes on a pizza. Um, and that is the first time most consumers taste an artichoke and, um, and it becomes a great pathway for them to um you know their curiosity brings them into fresh artichokes and yeah. so we see those as great partners for us um you just reminded me i have not had a pizza with artichoke hearts on them in a long time but i used to order those quite often so i'm going back to that it That's is a cool. delicious pizza it's the number one way that artichokes are served in restaurants oh, yeah. just when fun. my child was six when we'd go eat at that restaurant i would have to order her own artichoke because she was not Sharon and <laughs> that thing was gone. So her name <laughs> isn't Sharon either. I mean. Sorry, <laughs> let me enunciate. Uh... But um, a little bit uh, shifting gears. The Brussels sprouts, you're saying like a hundred years you guys have grown that? Like uh mm -hmm. Brussels sprouts, you've come a long way, baby. Um, we have, you know, it's interesting looking at the company history. Ocean Mist and, and its owners were really innovators in a lot of crops like Brussels sprouts. They were one of the first ones to grow broccoli in the Salinas Valley. Um, they started growing broccoli in the early 1950s. Um, they um, were one of the first to grow fennel. Um, one of the first, and I think still the only, to grow Cardoni. Um, and good Italian families will know what Cardoni is. It's it's a cousin of the artichoke. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, they were uh, they were doing Brussels sprouts before Brussels sprouts were popular. But uh, it is uh, it's been a fantastic item for the company. It it's one of our faster growing items. I roast Brussels sprouts. And I probably have been roasting for my family 15 years, quite the trendsetter. Are any of your farms restorative farming? Um, we were kind of pioneers in restorative farming because even the perennials that um, are grown year in, year out, um, we will cut them down, you know, to close to, to the ground level. And um, if you look at an artichoke plant, 90% um, of the, or 95% or of the plant is all leaves. You know, it's a very small portion that actually is the artichokes. And so those leaves have gotten plowed back into the soil year after year. And, you know, when you know that a, a plant is healthy for humans, you know, and if you look at artichokes, they really have an amazing nutritional story. They're high in a lot of vitamins. They're high in a lot of minerals. They're really high 
they actually say artichokes have the highest amount of antioxidants out of any vegetable you can eat. Um, huh. Especially uh, the purple ones, I suppose. Right. So, so you know, they're really good. But all that nutrition is in that plant. And if you think about it, when you're plowing those leaves and things back into the soil, you're adding a, a lot of really nutrient-dense foliage back into the soil. When I go back and think about our forefounders coming here from Italy, some of the, the best and easiest farmland was the the land that was more inland away from the ocean and you know i tend to think that probably our forefathers kind of got pushed near the ocean because it was brackish soil um, very very shallow water table marshy area and now it is just absolutely rich deep loamy soil and i think a big part of that is over the years they continued to put this, the byproducts from the artichokes back into the soil. And you do that for a hundred years and you really improve the quality of the soil. So right now, restorative ag is is a big thing, sort of keeping carbon in the soil. And, and I think that artichokes and Brussels sprouts have both been great crops for, for being able to do that. And it's something that our growers learned a real long time ago. That's very interesting. I didn't think about that. Most of that plant is going back into the soil. Yep. Uh, very little of it is actually harvested. I hadn't thought about that. And I imagine many of our listeners are going to be surprised to learn that artichokes are actually a flower. <laughs> uh, I know when I first learned it, I was. Uh, tell us more about the artichoke flowers. And artichoke flower is absolutely beautiful. Um it's interesting, though, you know, again, I, my caveat is I've only worked for Ocean Mist for seven months, so I'm still learning tons. Um, so my curve is really steep. And I learned that um, as an artichoke grower, it's an insult if you let any of your artichokes go to flower because it means that you you know, you weren't harvesting, you weren't keeping your plants up. And and I had a chef that wanted to do a presentation at the Culinary Institute of America. And she wanted to show how versatile artichokes were that, you know, not only can you eat the plant, but they're beautiful in a floral arrangement. So I started asking, how can I get some artichoke flowers? And you would have thought that that I had said the most offensive thing. <laughs> the growers like we don't have artichoke flowers, and so I, I end up getting one of our our researchers in the very far reaches of a research plot to let a plant go mature and produce some flowers, so that they, we could cut and send some up. But uh, but yes, Cynthia, you are right. If if you really um, you know want to see a beautiful flower. An artichoke is related to a thistle plant. And so, you know, when you think about how beautiful thistles are when um, when they go to flower, an artichoke really is a, a big thistle. I will give you a, a couple little sort of fun um, tidbits. Um, an artichoke, while it is a thistle, is not most closely related to a thistle. It's more closely related to a sunflower. Oh, interesting. So, kind of a kind of a fun little fun but fact. A sunflower is not a thistle, or it is a thistle as well. It's, it it is be. in it is in the same thistle family. And in an artichoke, while it looks more closely like a thistle, and, and it is a thistle in that family, it it is more genetically linked to a sunflower which i thought was kind of cool i i i didn't know that at all yeah, I, didn't, I didn't know that either. It, uh, artichokes are also the official vegetable of california oh which, i didn't know that really uh, that makes well. sense though that makes so when you sense. think about all the other vegetables we grow um artichokes was honored and selected as the official vegetable of california i know so edwin knows this but um Early in the days of the Artichoke Advisory Board, they created an artichoke festival um, here in Castroville, which is still running. It's going to be held in June at the Monterey Fairgrounds this year. So kind of fun. It's a very long running um, food festival. But in the first year to try and create publicity, they had a beauty contest. 
And one of the contestants was selected as the very first artichoke queen. And do you know who that is? Yep. <laughs> I know it, so I won't guess. Oh, I think that they all know it. I have no idea. We talked about it the other day. At yeah. The, at the time, her was name was I on the, the podcast. Yes. In fact, you made a smart comment about it. Uh huh. At the oh, time, oh. Cynthia, her name was Norma Jean, and she ended up uh, changing her name to become Marilyn. To Monroe. Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> so Marilyn Monroe was our industry's very first artichoke queen, and yeah. I always said I feel really bad for the local girls that were in that contest <laughs> when all of a sudden the Southern California model shows up and, and um, steals the show. But uh, it was <laughs> kind of a publicity stunt to help her you know, gain some notoriety. And you Did they... too can be a famous uh, celebrity. <laughs> Just get, uh, become uh, Miss Artichoke. Do they still have an artichoke queen? They don't do that anymore. Um, yeah, it's, it's been quite some time. I think they only did the artichoke queen for about the first 10 or, or 15 years of the festival. But yeah, uh, I wonder what year that was that Marilyn Monroe Oh, you know what? Um, it was in the 50s, I would guess. In the 50s, yeah. I I should know that. And somebody actually told me that although we said that Norma Jean was the first, that uh, somebody who did a little bit of research found out that she had already begun to change her name to Marilyn Monroe when she came up here and, and did that contest. But uh, yeah. it's a fun fact. And if you drive down the uh, Main Street, Castroville, um, you will see some pictures in, in, uh, of Marilyn Monroe. And so anybody is curious about why that is. That yeah. She also wore a potato, a dress made out of a potato sack or something else somewhere. Who? For the Idaho Marilyn. potatoes, yeah. Idaho potatoes. Who was that? Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe. Monroe. She could have worn a potato sack. I mean, <laughs> she was a friend of the produce industry for a very long time. It's interesting when, um, you know, I was still early in the industry. Um, it may have been, Teresa, when I was working with you. Um, and we did so much work with Pat Hopper and the Artichoke Board. And Pat is actually still around. Um, mm -hmm. fun, to, fun to say. Um, yeah. I remember being so impressed with Ocean Mist as a company. And yes. I actually remember thinking at that point, you know, someday I could actually, I would love to market that brand. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that was back in, it goes back a long time, back yeah. to yeah. the late eighties, early nineties. So I felt, it was fun to be here. I felt the same way when I represented them for a short, I think one year I did it. Uh, I felt the same thing. They, they were just a superior company uh, uh, in, in all respects. And, uh, and that reminds me of your gold standard. And you, you've already hit on that a little bit when you were talking about um, the farmers are not just concerned with yield, but want to make sure that flavor comes in there as well. So yeah, tell no, us I, a little bit about the gold, ocean mist gold standard. I, I appreciate that. So um, we refer to ourselves as the, the Ocean Mist Gold Standard, and, and we use that term, um, we're the gold standard of artichokes. It, it started out as a marketing campaign, um, which is interesting. And, and it was because when we went out and visited our retail customers, um, and when we were listening to what they were saying, they were always saying, boy, you know, you guys are the gold standard of artichokes, you're the gold standard of produce. Um, and, and I think we're really fortunate and, and have worked really hard to earn a reputation as being a really high quality producer of, of fresh vegetables. And um, from the marketing perspective, we're saying, boy, if that's what we're hearing from our customers, let's just, that's a great campaign. We're the gold standard. Um, what's exciting though, is that while it started as a marketing campaign, the company really adopted it as a um, as a sort of a strategic focus you know so what does the gold standard mean and each department in our company has really um, embraced the whole gold standard and it's become more than a marketing slogan and and so when we're trying to identify and select the varieties that we want to grow it really has to be about 
flavor, flavorful varieties, high quality varieties, maybe not the highest yielder varieties, our social responsibility specifications, how we treat each other, how we entreat our, how we treat our employees, all have a gold standard metric that we live to. And so while a gold standard, you know, was just a slogan in the beginning, it's really exciting that the company took that slogan and said that's something meaningful that we can all actually um, work towards. And and so, you know, now yeah, it's become a corporate culture, it sounds it, like. It and, is. you know, you exhibited that right early in this show because you said when I asked you about the floods and the rain, the first thing you said was, I'm happy to say our our employees, our people are safe. You didn't go to, oh, we're losing money. So I think that exhibits that idea right there. Yeah, and, and I think that's really consistent with the whole company. So, you know, while I am the marketer and, and I like a great slogan and, and we'll continue to, to talk about the gold standard with our um, customers, um, I think from a cultural standpoint, the gold standard is going to live with this company probably for the next hundred years because it really has become something that we all talk about, that we all set up our, our metrics and our, um, you know, our measurable indexes towards. And, and um, it's, it's, it's exciting. So it, it really is more than a slogan. This company does put its, its money where its mouth is. And now they've put their money where their mouth is by hiring the gold standard of produce marketing executives and Mark Munger. We're so happy that you're there now and enjoying your new life and career there. Well, we probably need to let you go, but first, we have a little ritual that you must partake of. Teresa, do you have a pun for us today? I do, I do. Now I have so, to let I have to let Mark know. Uh, I don't know if you've listened to many of our every episode. We have a segment called Home Run because uh, Teresa loves her puns so much. She <laughs> wants to so deliver usually, a pun every episode. And you usually apologize in advance. I do. That's what I'm going to do. It's going to be bad. That's why we groan. We don't laugh. No laughter allowed. You have to groan. I wish I'd practice my groaning. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Let me introduce it then. Produce Buzzers podcast fans, it's time for your favorite segment on the Produce Buzzers podcast. Yes, it's time for home grown. Uh, no, no, no. Don't, don't, don't turn the show off. You have to listen. You have to be punished by Teresa. Teresa, what is this week's home grown? Well, before I get to the actual groan, all this uh, drama surrounding a pun, you know, you're only about half as likely to die from a vegetable pun as you are to choke. Uh, uh, I, was, I thought it was going to be something about like, uh, what happens when you eat an artichoke? You need like the Heimlich maneuver. <laughs> no 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 so here's the actual pun. oh okay uh, okay so what did the farmer get when he crossed broccoli with a melon okay now we we always try to guess these mark to try to guess what the answer is so what did the farmer get when he crossed broccoli with a melon any guesses out there Oh, I think I know. Melancholy. <laughs> How about a case of melancholy? Oh. <laughs> wow, I was going to say something about if he had to cross the... <laughs> oh, we didn't groan. Nobody groaned. Uh, that was good. Uh, that, was, that was good. Oh, well. It Mark. was good that you finally got one and that you guessed it. <laughs> yeah, that's unusual for me. <laughs> yeah anyway well we've kept hey, Mark, you way too you long like... i think we'll we'll keep talking if you want but i think you probably need to go <laughs> no i i appreciate it i i really appreciate you guys including uh ocean mist and me on on the podcast and oh, yeah. uh, i can't tell you what a pleasure it is i'm going to be smiling 
for weeks now to get to, <laughs> to see you all and talk with you all and reminisce a little bit. And, and I appreciate uh, the conversation on artichokes. Yeah, great. So remember, listeners, oceanmist.com or allaboutartichokes.com. Go look at those recipes. They are fantastic. You'll love them. And look for that Ocean Mist label. Uh, so thank you, Mark, once again, for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. We love uh, you, Mark, and we miss it, you. <laughs> it's so great to see you all. I hope I get to see you soon. And um, I love you all, too. Um, like I said, you guys are, are real special. When uh, a young man gets to cut his teeth with some great people, they never leave your heart. That's, that's, that's moving. Thank you so much, Mark. Appreciate that. All right. Well, great. Good luck, man. Keep up all okay. the good work. Take Look forward care. to seeing you all soon. Okay. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Well, thank you listeners for tuning in to the Produce Buzzers podcast, brought to you by Produce Buzz, a gathering place for lovers of fresh fruits and veggies. We hope you were entertained a bit and educated a lot about fresh produce. Be sure to join us next time, and please tell your friends to do so as well. Like, share, and comment on our Produce Buzz Facebook page, and check out our website at www.producebuzz.com There you will find articles about fresh fruits and veggies how to select, store, and prepare them as well as lots of interesting facts about all the wonderful bounty the earth provides for us Until next time be fruitful and don't forget to veg out